I'm going to attempt to go, walk through this stuff, um, but I will defer to Lynn if there's any tough questions. Um, as you're all aware, this is the, probably the main reason that most of you are in the room tonight. Rattlesnake Creek and, and the Quivira National Wildlife uh, Refuge impairment. Uh, backstory, just bring everybody up to the same page. I will fly through this, so we're going to go fast through time. Spring, the impairment was filed by uh, Quivira uh, of 2013. July of 16, so three years later, the uh, Division of Water Resources found that there, yes, there was impairment, and it was a, an amount of a three to 5,000 acre feet over a 12-year period. Real-time administration will not work and found that groundwater reductions and or augmentation would be needed. Note the and or. That is a quote from, the, from that document. This year, we submitted in the late fall of 2016 and then again in 2017 in the early spring proposals to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to provide Augmented, augmented stream flow directly to them. Surprise, those were both declined. So we asked the state, what would you characterize the remedy to be? What would it look like if you were, if you were to be providing this remedy? And I will tell you, it is not pretty. Uh, so, the next month, in August, we said, as, as a district, we said, we're going to pursue this as a Lima. It's not going to be an Iguka. We want this to be a Lima. We want the local stakeholders to be driving this boat. So what's that look like? Throughout the last two years, it feels like a whole lot longer than that. We've been working toward this plan. In December, we put together our first approved plan and submitted that to the chief engineer. It, had, it was a Effective January 1, 2020, required the removal of all end guns at that point. Provide stream flow augmentation to Quivira at the in the stream channel, and then have incentivized retirements and transfers of water out of critical areas. Okay, this plan is still out on our website. You can go download it if you'd like, uh, but I'll get to something that's more important here in a bit. This is the area of concern. The red boundary is the Lima boundary. It is not a sub-basin boundary. It is the Lima boundary. It's bound by use, using the model to determine the area of impact to zenith gauge of 10% or greater. And copies of this map are on the back. If you haven't seen them, uh, they're big and bold. I encourage you to take a good look at it to see if you're in or out of the area. And also, uh, no, I'll get to that in a second. So, in a week later after the GMD proposed that Lima to the state, we get a response saying, sorry, you have three deficiencies. You didn't meet all the statutory requirements for a complete Lima plan. It said that we did not have clear geographic boundaries stated outright. We did not propose clear corrective goals or goals and corrective control provisions to meet those stated goals. And we did not give due consideration to water users who have already implemented voluntary reductions for conservation. In the time since that December 20 uh, letter from the chief, we received a couple memos from the KDA outlining their review of some of the objectives in the Lima plan on, on augmentation sufficiency and in gun removal. So despite the chief engineer in December saying, oh, we can't review it because you don't meet all the statutory requirements. We yet have a review. So I, it was confusing. Um, so today we've, we've been working with uh, Lynn Preheim with Stinson Leonard Street uh, as an attorney with Peter Blue uh, out of Blue Groundwater out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then John Donnelly with Divine Donnelly and Murray out of Topeka uh, to try and craft a solution that is palatable to all stakeholders involved. What does that look like? Uh, recently, there are two documents. That they, there are copies in the back that I encourage everyone to pick up. The first one, less so than the second. The first one is a resolving Quivira impairment. That is from the perspective of the district. We answer the same questions that the, the state answered in one of their memos. 
Okay, I encourage you to take a look at that. That was backed by Below Groundwater and Stenson Leonard Street uh, on what was said in that memo. But the, probably the more important one, in my opinion, is the one authored directly by Peter Ballou. And it's, it's back there on, on his letterhead, and it outlines this, how the Lima plan is sufficient as an impairment remedy, how it satisfies it completely. Okay? And in that memo, it references some, some figures. This is a fig, what's called figure two out of the chief engineer's assessment of the augmentation plan. In rough terms, we see the stream flow declining over the past and continuing to decline into the future, but it stabilizes at some point in the future. That's not really an argument. We don't have an argument there. The runoff is really pretty, pretty status quo going forward. We don't have an argument there. Where we have a difference of opinion, and I say it's more than just difference of opinion, difference of fact, is this red line. The state contends that base flow, the, the water that is contributed to the stream from the aquifer, point in the future, actually 2018, 2019, will drop below zero and the stream will go dry. The base flow will no longer be, going, be a contributing factor to stream flow. Peter Ballou took a very close look at that figure and came up with his own interpretation, his own <coughs> output from the model. And remember, P Peter Ballou is the author of that model. Okay, so we're talking about the, the guy that knows the model the best in the world. He knows this thing inside and out. So if he tells us that this is how the model is, is should be interpreted, I can take that to the bank myself. His interpretation of the model is the base flow, <coughs> while yes, is declining, it stabilizes and never goes below zero. So base flow is all continuing to be contributing to the stream from the aquifer. So the stream does not go dry. Total stream flow and base flow both stay above the zero mark into the future. That is the issue at hand here. That is the difference of opinion between KDA, DWR, and GMD5. I cannot stress that enough. Any questions on this right now? I know that I'm going very fast. This is status quo. Yes. Status quo going forward. No no modification to the to the pumping. This is what it looks like. So no modification. Base flow stays very, very good. It's diminished, but it's still there. So, where are we at today? As of a couple hours ago, the board approved another revision to the Lima draft. It's on the back, hopefully you got some. There are about 100 copies or so, hopefully, they were printed out today. Um, I encourage you to take a look, good look at it. It is approved by the board. It will be submitted tomorrow morning to the chief engineer officially. It is posted to our website for download if you so desire. Uh, we encourage everyone to take a good look. What's in it? You'll notice these are very familiar. Effective January 1, 2020, remove all end guns. Okay? Stream flow augmentation, incentivize retirements and transfers out of critical areas. I copied and pasted that from the previous proposal because they are exactly the same. Okay? Why are they the same? Because Baloo Groundwater says that, that the Lima plan is sufficient. So why are we doing anything beyond that? Anything else is, is a waste of time and money. Okay? But we're not going to do that. Wow, that's all I had. That was very brief. Um, the Lima plan is a 10-year plan. Effective January 1, 2020. The previous, had a, previous plan had a five-year review, midway point. That's gone. This is a 10-year review. Because any hydrologic effect would not be seen at year five. So what are we doing? There's too much of a hydrologic lag in the system 
to be beneficial. So we're just wasting, wasting time. It does not mean that we're not going to take a look at what's going on in the system annually. Absolutely we are. We're going to keep a very close eye on what's going on. But that's, there's no need for a formal review at year five. Okay. Um, i trying to think of other major issues, major revisions. Um, one of the criteria that we were cited on as deficient, we did not give due consideration for past water conservation. Okay. The current Lima plan does not have water use reductions in it, period. Let me repeat. No water use reductions in it. That is supported by Peter Ballou and his science. So, if we're going to be giving conservation, giving consideration for past conservation, what are you going to be rewarding folks for? You're not going to be able to give them extra water in an allocation. There are no allocations. We've tried to figure this stuff out. There's, you can't do it. So it's, it's, a, it's a moot issue. So it's, there's, this, there's a short paragraph describing that in the plan, uh, page five or six, I believe. Um, but that's, that's all there is in there. Um, there is a clause for corrective controls, section eight, that talks about what happens if, at the end of it, there's still issues going on. Well, what this plan says is that the corrective control is, we'll take a look at with the modeling, if more augmentation is needed, we'll pump more water. If less is needed, we'll throttle that back. But we'll stay in balance with what the science says is needed. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay? If at some point the review committee and DWR and the district come to an agreement that there is something, there, the gap between what is needed and what is being supplied is too great, then we look to the chief engineer for an IGUCA. That's a huge if. That's assuming that our science today is bunk and doesn't work. I don't believe that's the, the case. Are we going to continue to refine our science? Sure. We're going to be catching that and keeping a close eye on that all the way leading up to that. So getting to that clause C in section 8. I don't believe we'll see, but it's in there just in case, okay? Any concerns or questions? Those are the, the big, big revisions to this plan that were different from last time in December. Sure, John. We are expecting more rejections. Yes. Yes. We do anticipate seeing inherent consumptive use savings by removing the end guns. That is the basis for everything. We're not, however, requiring an allocation that reduces your ability to pump your system. There's a huge difference there. Okay? The state would like to see water use reductions. So bring you down to about 50% of your authorized water right. No, we're not doing that. We disagree. The science doesn't prove it. The science is not there. If that was the case, base flow would be dropping below, below zero, and then we have a bigger issue to, to address. That's not the case. Stafford County is a full bucket. I'll get to this in a bit, but in the annual meeting packet, you see the water level change map. If you look at Stafford County, look at how much blue is in there. Almost the entire Stafford County is in blue. If you talk to Kansas Geological Survey and ask them about Stafford County, they'll say Stafford County is at or above pre-development levels. So why are we reducing water use in an area that has water table that is rising? It doesn't make sense. Okay? Any other questions? I probably won't go further than what some of the many want to see. Rita. Acres of use going to stay the same with the end gun removal? We would require, right, 
we would require that the end gun be removed from the system. Not just shut off, but removed from the system. Okay? There would be an inherent reduction of acres that would be wetted acres with your system. Okay? But your allocation remains the same. All right? Why is that going to save water? How can we say that's going to save water? If we were deficit irrigating and always trying to play catch up every single year, and the crop was always looking for more water, the argument's valid. But that's not the case here. Here, our water use and the amount that the state even says would be required based on the climate, very high correlation. So we're using the right amount of water. We're not using excess. And our crops are fully irrigated. If we were chasing that all the time, then having that extra water put onto smaller acres would be an increase in consumptive use. But that's not the way it works. This is all based on the sign, on Peter Ballou's testimony that you'll see in the in the uh, in his handout tonight. Okay, that's a confusing topic right there. I know. Sure. I just want to make sure everybody understands that Peter Ballou's model was created at uh, your all's expense in GMD five. He's been working with uh, the GMD for over 15 years, I would say, by now, something like that, more, maybe over 20. And so he's got a really good understanding of the basin. And he created this model not in a partisan way, not to assist GMD-5 or anything. It's just a scientific model of how this basin operates hydrologically. And so he put it all together, and then you were generous enough to share it with the Division of Water Resources, who is using the very same model. There isn't anybody in, the, in this debate who isn't using the same model. What Peter Ballou says, and has proven now with some information, is that augmentation absolutely will solve the problem. It will solve the impairment of the plate from Quivira. What has happened is when uh, DWR utilized the model, they concluded that base flow ultimately would be depleted to the point where it, the stream would, would be dry. And that is the primary argument that DWR has used to sort of push away from the first draft of the Lima document that we sent them back in December. They're basically saying stream flow is going to deplete to nothing or, and base flow is going to deplete to nothing and therefore the 15 CFS well field that you're proposing isn't going to be adequate in the future once that stream bed goes dry. But, uh, frankly, Peter Ballou says they're wrong. And he said they, they've made some mistakes on use of the model. It's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of how you interpret the information. It's just simply a matter of how they utilize the model. And as the chart that Oren showed earlier establishes, that base flow is still going to be positive. It's never going to go to a negative state. And so that being the case, Peter is 100% confident that augmentation solves the problem. That is why uh, we're not pushing any cutbacks as part of this Lima other than just the removal of end guns. So that's what the current Lima draft does. I just want to make sure everybody knows that you know, all of this has been done scientifically without a, a partisan bent or you know, it's just a, a model, the science that has been used to establish the Lima document that we're proposing. So that's what the board approved today and, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, work with DWR and, and Chief Engineer Barfield to convince them to uh, push this thing through. So that's that's the idea and, and it's kind of, all's kind of gonna be in DWR's court now. So. One thing that Kevin pointed out and I appreciate it. Uh, during the model's creation, and throughout the creation, as well as after, uh, DWR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Waterpack all peer reviewed that model in its creation and concluded that yes, it is a good model for its use in this area. 
Otherwise, why would KDA be using it for not just this issue, but also Hayes and other things going on? Okay. I'm going to add more to that. So originally, uh, the, the model as created was a seven layer model where layers of the strata were evaluated going down into the you know, different depths because that's more accurate and, and more precise, I guess you could say. DWR decided that it is overdone and actually elected to use it in a three layer version or one layer. Yeah, that's right. So they didn't even use the full capabilities of the model in doing their review. They just thought that a one layer evaluation would be adequate. So uh, it's, it's a complicated deal and it, it is a really fine tool and it's the one that everybody's using with, with good justification. So hopefully now that uh, Peter's been through the concerns that DWR has expressed, they will uh, come on board and we'll of course make uh, him available for them to talk to if, if necessary to talk them through the mistakes that were made in, in coming to the conclusion that they came to. So. Has the model accounted for the rainfall that we get? How, since it's been in effect for a while, how's it good? How's it matching? Uh, Peter Blue, uh, I've, I've, taught, I've asked him questions to that effect. Um, not precise for that, but to that effect. How's the tracking going forward over the last years? Because the model data stops in 2008. Uh, but how, so how's it predicting these last years? It does a very good job. It, it's reproducing this information with a high degree of accuracy. So I even have more specific information than that. So the model has a 4% margin of error. And uh, so what he did is he took the historical stuff and put the model to it and said, what is it predicted? Has it been right? And it's, it's within that 4% margin of error. So everything that's happened since has been consistent with the predictions that the model made. So it's, it's accurate and uh, within the margins of error. I guess I'll stay up. Any other questions about it? Yes, sir. The question of augmentation, uh, I, have you projected any cost and who would pay for that and, and at what time will, will this need to get implemented to be a satisfactory to, to the state? So I'm going to let Orrin answer part of it. Uh, Water Pack has been trying to assist in figuring out different options for financing that might work and, and ways that we could fund it. That's included, you know, foundations, people who might be willing to make contributions towards the expense of the well field. I don't think, you know, building a well field is a complicated deal with the number of wells that are going to have to be built. I don't know that we have anything that's formal enough to give an estimate as to what that cost is going to be. Warren might have better information about that than I do, but uh, he can talk about how it, you know, possibly could be funded. Not all of that is, is detailed out yet, but. The augmentation program, where are we at with this progress? Um, this is a new thing for us to, to try and venture into. It's a project that is a precedent setter for the state, a precedent setter for the state. So very early on with the blessing of, of Daryl uh, and, and some of the board members, I said, this is outside of my expertise for crafting a plan that's going to be satisfactory. So I reached out to the water office and graciously with their blessing, they've been helping to craft this, what we're called request, request for proposals. It is a document that will uh, be sent out to engineering firms to determine what this proposal is going to look like, how much it's going to cost, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're in the very early stages of those discussions with the water office about how to craft that, that proposal. Uh, it will obviously be going to the board for their sign off before it goes out to the engineering firms because it's going to be a pretty big price tag. Uh, how to fund it? Great question. If you have, we're happy to take checks in if you want to send some in. Uh, no, we don't have a good plan today to fund it because we don't know what size of elephant this thing looks like. 
If it's at 5 million, if it's at 25 million, if it's 100 million, we don't know how big it's going to be. Because when you, we have a theory of what it's going to look like. Somewhere back here's the map. Okay. Based on the modeling we've done, 46 wells south of Guevara will do everything we need it to do. That's assuming land access. That's assuming appropriation of water from the state. That's assuming a lot of things. That's assuming that the real world test site data matches up with what the model says. That's assuming that what the offer in that area is producing as far as water quality matches up with what our test data says today. There's a lot of stuff that's involved throughout that process that will, will possibly drive that price tag up or down. We don't know yet. But that's going to be part of this proposal is to scope it out, do site-specific testing to make sure that what we're theorizing for that area matches up with what the real-world data says then we can go out to, to hone that proposal again to actually go out and get contractors and start the process. So what's the time frame? Good idea. Good, or no idea. I don't, I don't have a good idea. We're working on that with the water office to, to get a realistic time frame, but we don't have it nailed down yet. I wish I had that ready to go that we could present today. We just don't have it. Hopefully that was sufficient. I know it wasn't very good. But. One other problem that the real concern we have about the neighbors is we do not contaminate their water by asking them. John made mention of a very real concern we have, and I know the, the augmentation well field neighbors, the folks that live here, produce there, have. We don't contaminate what's existing there today. We don't want to do that. The last thing we want to do is that. And I'm looking at some folks in the eye when I say that, that I know live there. We will not. We'll do everything in our power to prevent that from happening. Does the model, does the model have any, any science to, to that part of it? Yes. That's part of the layering that, that Lynn was talking about. Those layers are in there. Some of those layers toward the bottom, the, I think layer three and four, are the Permian layers that are the, the high chloride bearing layers in this area. So we can, utilizing that model with all the layers involved, not flattening it to single, but with all the layers, you can watch the migration of water between those layers. And based on the model as we've done it here, the migration doesn't come up. The water stays and flows from the east, or from the west. And let me just add to that a minute. Um, one of the things that the model reflects and the reason that there's so many wells is because they need to be smaller wells with uh, less uh, chance of upwelling so that you don't interfere with other layers and so what people Lewis said is you've got to have more wells smaller wells that stay within the right layers so that you don't bring up other uh, contaminants and stuff into the into the water and that's one of the things that we have to re that we have to comply with in connection with the Lima 2 is that we have to bring a certain quality of water to the Quivira as part of the deal and so that's also a really big factor in how these wells operate so but yet but the question is absolutely it's a really big part of what's being analyzed in selecting the location of the well field, the number of wells, the depths of the wells, the capacity of the wells, all of that stuff is part of what's in that model. We are today collecting samples from that area. Uh, we'll continue to collect those samples uh, as we get moving, continue to move forward to provide that information to Kansas Department of Health and Environment to make sure that we're not affecting not just Rattlesnake Creek, but also Povera. Because Rattlesnake Creek itself is classified as an impaired water for water quality, something to that effect. Covira, same thing. It is classified as an impaired waters of, of Kansas for water quality. And I'm grossly paraphrasing that. 
But all that means is KDHE has a very close watch on what's on the water quality for that region. And so we're working with Tom Stiles with Kansas Department of Health and Environment to make sure that we're not going to raise the chloride content or decrease the chloride content because Quivira doesn't need fresh water. They don't need high chloride, high conductivity water. They need something in the middle. It's salty, but not too salty. Rita? Compare based on its salt content or? Yes. Yes. For KDHE, it's an impaired water for water quality. Yes. For water quality. So water quality can also be contributing to pesticides. Sure, it can be. It can be for KDHE, but in this case, they're watching chloride content. And Matt, please correct me if I'm incorrect there. Saw a hand. I saw it. Yes, Carolyn. Well, I was just wondering that in your um, in your projection of the you know the places to put the wells, are you considering both locations south of the refuge as well as those that might be on the refuge, and, and what both the, the trade-offs in terms of cost, but also you know water quality might be with the various options. Right. How did we get to this well field design versus others is, is the nut of it. And I'll get to your specific question about on property and site. Well, groundwater, as well as Kansas Water Office, uh, the district, um, KDA, we've been looking at augmentation for Rattlesnake Creek for decades. There are studies that show that we could put wells here near 281, near where the wild horse dumps into Rattlesnake Creek. There are studies that say, well, we could put water uh, wells out here to the east of Quivira, to the south, along the Rattlesnake Creek corridor itself, wells up here north. They all have inherent issues with them. If you go north, up here, two issues are the big ones, quantity and quality. One, there's a lot of sheet flow that comes into Quivira from the west that if we start interrupting that, this impairment starts over again. Now, arguably, that is unmetered water. But you better believe they will raise a stink about it. It's also very poor quality water, worse so than the south. OK, so, so that was marked off the list pretty quick. To the east, east of Quivira, water quality. Water quality starts really ratcheting up, 20,000 parts per million, fairly shallow in the aqua, fairly shallow to the water table. So that was knocked off. So it says, okay, let's go west along the corridor. Well, there's a problem there too. One, if you put, put wells here at 281 and dump it in the creek, you have a lot of transmission loss. You're not gonna get all the water that you pump show up at Quivira. It's going to be seeping back to the ground and lost, and you're not going to get credit for it. Well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to do that. It's inefficient. It's way too inefficient. So why don't you just sprinkle some wells along the Rattlesnake Corridor and do that? That's an option. But what we found out is by manifolding these wells to the south, it actually achieves both quality and quantity that is very, very sustainable for a very long time. So it's, it ticks off all of the check marks in our boxes. Okay. So now to, to Carolyn's question about siting wells on property. Well, NEPA, Endangered Species Act. It's going to take a lot of work to go to overcome those federal regulations and statutes. Are we opposed to that? Absolutely not. To get this off the ground, how we've, how, I'll just be very frank about it. How we're drafting this proposal today with Kansas Water Office is as a phased approach. It's what Peter Ballou recommends in his documentation is a phased approach. Come into it with a small first phase to make sure it works. Reality check it, make sure everything works fine. Then if you need to, ramp it up. What I would like to see is that second phase have one or two wells sited on property. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of discussions with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, 
the folks in D.C. to make that happen. I'm not saying we're opposed to it. It's highly efficient if we can do that. But it's a lot of red tape. We've requested previously and continue to ask, highlight those issues and we'll address them. Tell us what we need to do to, to address it and we'll do it. And we've not been told what those issues are to date. Okay. So in the interest of getting things moving forward, this is the theory we have right now. It's not, fine, not necessarily the final plan. It's got to be fact checked. But this is what the theory says will work. It has a lot of information, sorry. Questions? Yeah. Is the service uh, doing any of their part of sharing in, in the expense of this? Sharing in the expense? I would argue no. Uh, however, um, KDA, DWR, to their credit, has requi is requiring, and you heard me say this last year, is requiring the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to update their conservation plan. Basically, their metering plan, everything involved with how they operate and maintain Quivira National Wildlife Refuge for compliance with their water right. That's happening. We've requested uh, to see a copy of that as it's being drafted to make sure that what we're planning is in line with it. We've not seen a copy of it yet. Not saying we won't, just saying we haven't seen it yet. But yes, they are being held to bring some things up to date, but as far as sharing costs, the augmentation plan, or anything else, I'm, I'm a pretty good optimist, but I'm not that optimistic. Any other questions? Not, there's one other factor, and I think it's in the materials that you guys have seen about this augmentation plan. And uh, believe it or not, the science shows, and, you know, the whole concept of augmentation is we give them the water when they want it. And the, the DWR is requiring us to basically meet a seasonal demand schedule that the, the, the service has requested. So <clears throat> one of the things that Peter Ballou did is he looked at it and said, what happens if we put this lean in place and use this augmentation plan? And the fact of the matter is, there would be more water, they, they would have more water than it was in 1956 pre-development. They'd get more water than they ever could have hoped for even before any irrigation wells were put in place. So uh, this is a plan that I don't, as long as the water quality and the other factors are met, there's no reason that the service shouldn't jump at. And uh, hopefully now that we can show that it's a sustainable plan and it doesn't deplete stream flow in the same way that the DWR thought it would. Uh, hopefully it, it'll work for them too. So. That it? Yes. Let's not lose sight of the fact that what you just said, that they're requesting water at a certain time of the year. Our water rights don't say that, and I'm just there. And Correct. they've been warned the way most of us have been warned that if there is no water, that's it. Right. And there's some drought contingency stuff built into our Lima plan too. Um, but that's absolutely true. And one of the arguments we've made throughout is that it's an annual water right. You don't get a say, I want this much in June and this much in September and, and so on. Um, and if we ever have to argue that in a different forum, we will. But hopefully we can work something out where we don't have to, to do it that way. Um, but, but that is entirely true. And back to the question about whether or not um, structures and wells on the preserve itself would be appropriate. You know, we have asked for that. Those were proposals that we asked the service to consider, and at least to this point in time, they rejected them. So if, if for some reason that would change, it would be great because it would make this even simpler. But whether that will happen or not, is, is anybody's guess. There are already man-made structures on Quivira. There are concrete structures. There are windmills and uh, cut channels and other things that exist across that uh, preserve that, you know, are man-made. So it's not like it's destroyed the habitat for the birds and such if you go in and put a well there. But whether they ever consent to such a thing is going to be the issue.
Yeah. Are there other case studies or examples you look at with this offsite augmentation or models um, that you use to help determine kind of what the metrics are of, of how you compensate for land access or the water access? No, and uh, you know that is going to be an issue eventually where these wells are going to be and how that is all acquired and so on. I don't know that there's any really any comparisons like this. I mean, you know, there's a concept where uh, augmentation, or not augmentation, but condemnation is used to acquire land for purposes of like of this. I don't know whether that is something that ultimately would be used or whether they'd be able to approach owners of water rights in the land in the area or whatever. I don't know how that's all going to play out. It's just going to have to see how we can make it work. Um, Yes, sir. Are there any politicians or anything us as constituents can do to pressure Barfield into accepting this? <laughs> I mean, you know. Yes, please. Um, the answer is yes. That's why John Donnelly is trying to help on that front. And anybody that's got influence with, you know, politicians, your legislators, Barfield in his office, you know, please exercise it. I mean, one of the thing, the cool things that WaterPAC did is evaluate the economic impact of this, um, of cutbacks, for example. So let me back up one step. Another thing that Barfield, I'm sorry, that Peter Ballou did is analyze Barfield's cutback requests. And all those meant was like 1.3 to 1.7 in the worst possible scenario. CFS, so it's it's almost a meaningless cut, whereas it's not meaningless to all of you. It's got a huge economic impact if he starts requiring cutbacks. So one of the things uh, that WaterPAC did is they commissioned an economic study of the area and how much the contribution of, of all of your wells and agriculture in the area is and so on. So. If you're looking at what the public interest is, and you're saying to yourself, okay, what's more important, the economic viability of this entire portion of the state, which is all driven by agriculture, or whether or not what is already and has always been an intermittent stream that doesn't flow all the time, whether there's base flow contributing to that stream. Now you tell me which is more important. And that's the position that we need to take and make sure Barfield understands. Uh, what public interest is served? I mean, it, it, one of the things that I've been tempted to do is just go take pictures of this stream bed, the, the Rattle, Rattlesnake Creek stream bed, and say, okay, if this doesn't run, or if it does, what's the big public interest that's being served by having more water in it more often? What is it? compared to the economic devastation that would happen to all of you if they start making enormous cutbacks when all we have to do is put in an augmentation well field that the science says will absolutely fix the problem. That's, that's it. Just to add to that, uh, if, if the chief engineer doesn't accept the proposal, will there be any uh, I think that there are options that we can't talk about in total now because it, it involves things that I have to deal with with your board. But there are options available to us if the chief engineer decides not to move forward with a Lima or institutes an IGUCA. And we'll explore those if we have to. I just. My hope is that we, we won't have to in light of all the new information and the new scientific stuff that we've developed. But, you know, I, uh, I suspect the fight will be on if, <laughs> if we can't get this done, because it makes sense. If we're, if we're in charge of paying for it, right. there's got to be some, some communication, some get along at some point or what's, you know, I mean, right. And even uh, if you look at the DWR, the recent publication they did where they said, here are the things, 
one of the first questions on it is, does DWR support augmentation? And it's an absolutely we do, because they recognize that it is part of the solution, if, if even though they haven't quite understood that it's the whole solution, or, or most of the solution, along with the uh, end gun removal and so on. So, yes, sir? Yeah, if you're going to request that the producers provide input to the legislative folks, would it be possible for you to put a standardized form on the DMV5 website so they don't get a bunch of conflicting information going to those folks and confusing the issue further? Yes, and in fact, one of the things that uh, I think we're working on as a board is a letter that basically outlines why we believe this should be adopted, that we'll have that sort of information detailed out in simple form with the supporting uh, documentation reference that you guys will need to take to your legislator. And the, the intent of the letter, of course, is let's get this out there. Let's make the public understand that this works and put whatever uh, influence we have into play and try to get DWR to go along with it. And hopefully that's going to be pretty fast. I mean, I'm, from from where we are, I think that letter's going to come out soon. We good? We're trying. You you should be very proud of your uh, your board, your uh, Lima committee. Uh, the number of hours is astronomical. You have no, no possible clue how much time has been spent doing this and uh, how much effort they put into it and how much thought and telephone calls and everything else from concerned citizens just trying to hear everybody and figure out what is a workable solution. And then the other piece of it is, you know, you are the only place that you had the foresight to hire somebody like Peter Ballou, who is a remarkable man and has a uh, tremendous reputation and, and built this model for you, uh, I just can't imagine standing in front of you and trying to figure out what we're going to do next without the science. And uh, that has been just a tremendous thing. And so you guys should be complimented for, I know it costs you some money, but uh, it, it's going to end up costing you a lot less than what would have happened to you had you not had it. So. Since the print on the screen is about the same size as the sheet in your hands, uh, and I, I believe in the fact I'm getting old, I, just because you have a smaller font, you don't have to use it. Uh, if you look, there's a page that looks like this, which has a comparison of our budgets for the last five years on it, and uh, kind of give you an idea of what we're doing and, and what we've done in the past. And, we basically have accumulated, there's no two ways around it, we've accumulated some cash because we knew this problem was growing on us. And so we were trying to get a little bit ahead of the game. And we've spent some money on a model and we've spent some money on attorneys and hydrologists, but I kind of think we did the right thing so far uh, in terms of being able to defend our position. If you look on the back side, I think it's on the back side that is the one. Yeah, well, I haven't looked at it since. Okay. Yeah, on the back side, uh, you'll see the adopted budget that we presented last year and was approved in August for 2019. And the budget was basically a million and a half dollars. And the assessments were a nickel an acre for every acre and a buck for every acre foot of water on your water permit. And the proposed budget for 2020, uh, the per acre assessment remains at, at a nickel, but the acre foot assessment, we raised it to $2 because with the augmentation and everything else that's about to come to a head, we need to start accumulating cash and because Orn, I, you know, I farmer math the augmentation field. I think I can build it for two and a half million dollars. 
but I wasn't going to have to get all the permits and do all the other things it's going to take to do it. So uh, I, don't, I don't know what the augmentation fuel will cost. And uh, so we're in the process of trying to get that stuff accumulated. So the proposed budget, we raised the assessment to $2 per acre foot, and that will allow us to come up close to a $2 million budget if we have to spend it. And we don't require anything other than information tonight, right? Are there any any questions, commentary on the budget process? I've already done the editorial part. Uh, July. Is it July or August? July. July. We'll have our formal, we will have at our July regular board meeting, we will adjourn and have a formal budget approval session. And so, uh, if in between now and then you have a thought on we're right, we're wrong, or we're indifferent, uh, please come to that meeting and speak up. <coughs> so, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your support. The one person that, well, persons that probably didn't get quite enough recognition tonight is Orrin and John and Michaela. Uh, this thing is a huge load on those people because the, the Lima committee looks at it and we listen to your complaints or your suggestions or whatever they happen to be, but in the end, we go, you know, Orrin, we've had these comments in the last month. Would you please deal with this? <laughs> and uh, and the nice thing about Orrin is he understands the concept of writing for the brand. And uh, he's backed our play and done what we needed to do in this process, which is in your best interest. And so I think he, uh, he deserves a round of applause, I think. With that, I'll throw up the ugly map. This was the drought condition from last year. Compared to this year. No shocker. We are out of, officially out of a drought emergency as a state, uh, border to border, which is the first time for a while now. Uh, usually we have a little bit of drought emergency dangling around somewhere. Uh, and how did we get to that point? Well, this area, you'll notice in your annual meeting packet tonight, some maps. The one I want to direct your attention to is the one with the red and blue on it. It's a, our, the same map that you guys get every year. It is a water level change map. Uh, we go out, I say we, John goes out uh, with help from Kansas Geological Survey and Kansas Department of Health and Environment, Kansas Department of uh, KDA DWR. Let's say that. Uh, to measure water levels every year, every, every January. We then take that data, put together this map for you to kind of get a trend analysis of what's happening uh, in the area. For this year, this is what it looks like. Very, very blue. The maximum rise based on a well, this is not interpolated or averaged out, this is actual raw data for each of these wells. The maximum is sitting right here in the center of Reno County in our district. 8.4 feet rise from January 2017, or January 2018 to January 2019. That's pretty cool. Not many places in the state can say that, that much of a rise annually. And it's sprinkled around with, with other rises around the area. Uh, the locations that have red are declines annually, but you'll notice they're very, very minor. And I asked John, I said, John, how can that be? You have, you have these big rises, and then you have a, a decline right in the middle of them. Well, those declines, typically last year were rises, and we're recovering from that rise, and it's just leveling back out. Okay, so it's nothing really to be concerned about. Uh, I'm going to pause real quick. John handed me a note that I need. I failed to do earlier. Um, if you guys have noticed when you guys were walking in, we have vendors out in the, in the foyer. You guys need to go and, and visit their booth and, and listen to what they have to, to tell you. Uh, they took time out of their night to come and listen to a bunch of squabbling about water. Uh, you need to go take a look at what they have to, 
to offer for your operations. We have Riggs Irrigation out there, uh, back on the far, I think you guys are across the far side. Is that right, Cameron? Yep, right inside the door. Uh, teeter Irrigation, uh, Raindrop Repair, and Channel Seed. Uh, one thing about Channel, they uh, have, I believe, water and some snacks out there uh, for folks if they, if you guys want to take something for the road, uh, they're, they're wanting to refresh you from this discussion uh, as you go home. So thank you to our vendors for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. So what are the issues in the district? Rattlesnake is not the only issue, unfortunately. We have some other issues. Haze, still out there, still lingering. Well, the Walnut Creek Iguka, and then website and social media. Uh, I'll get into what those actually look like in a second. For water bank, pay attention to that last little bit. There's a surprise I want to mention to you at the end, okay? Uh, but we do have some really interesting activity going on in the water bank. If you're not paying attention to the city of Hayes, you should. Okay. Currently authorized for 7,000, nearly 7,800 acre feet of irrigation water uh, from 57 water rights, or 57 wells, 30 water rights in Edwards County. They're requesting to move or transition that water uh, to municipal and pump it from 14 <coughs> wells uh, and then change the, where they're going to use that water to the city of Hayes. What's that actually look like? Here we are down here south of Kinsley. It's actually south of Oferly, uh, with where the R9 Ranch is located, transitioning to the 6,800 acre fit of municipal, and then moving it north to Hayes, to the well field for distribution. What's going on there? Well, we uh, put our two cents into it. Uh, in May, we received the request from KDA to review those change applications. Uh, took some time. We did a little bit of model work to review the work that had been done by Burns McDonald on behalf of the applicant, as well as any work that was done uh, by KDA in its evaluation. Uh, the state uh, is saying today, if they don't, if they use 4,800 acre feet on average in a 10-year period, that's okay, and then require water level monitoring. That's what. It, that's what it looked like when, it, when we received it. The GMD said, no, not quite good enough. Based on our modeling, that 4,800 acre feet still contributed to the decline of the area. Well, we want that change to not cause an adverse effect. So we said to do that, it needs to be modified down to 4,000 acre feet. Seems like a minor change. But it's, it's a significant change, it's 20%. And instead of just monitoring the water level in the area, we also need to pay attention to the water quality coming into the area, because that is a pretty nasty water in that region, and we've got to be paying attention to that. That is the headwaters for the district right there. So we've got to be paying attention, because whatever happens there feeds into the rest of the area. We submitted our change our recommendations to the state um, in September. Um, here we are in February 2019. We're still waiting on those change applications to, to move forward. We don't know if they'll be approved, denied. My guess is approved contingently. Um, last month, the cities did amend their monitoring program to include water quality, which I appreciate. So at least the city is listening to what the GMD is wanting to have happen. Uh, we received earlier this month a letter, the, the GMD board received a letter from the Mid-Arc Sub-Basin Protection Group. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, that letter uh, stated that we as Mid-Arc Sub-Basin Group support GMD and encourage vehemently I'm putting some words in there now, so I've got to be careful. Vehemently to have the chief engineer take the GMD's recommendations serious and to consider them in, in, this, in his uh, review of these change applications. There's gross paraphrase in there, but I think that was the gist of it. Is that correct, Pat? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we'll stay tuned. 
we don't know where that when that's going to hit. Um, if you're also following the news, City of Hayes and their City Council meeting this week, I think. Um, we're pretty outspoken about what they want to see happen with these change applications. Uh, so, so it's the it's about to heat up. Walnut Creek. You'll notice this slide is exactly the same as it was last year. We're still waiting on the formal review of that IGUCA. Um, yeah, we've been waiting since what 2015. Here we are, 2019. <laughs> There's been a few things that popped up on the radar since we made that request. So I understand, but we still this is still a hot issue for us to be addressed. Still to date, no hearing has been set <laughs> on this issue. Website, if you guys have been paying attention to our website, hopefully you have. We have completely revamped it, meaning we, Michaela in our office, say hi Michaela, uh, has gone through our website and revamped it from ground up. We hope that it is much more informative, much more user friendly. There are a few items on there that have never been there before. You can come in and schedule an appointment with, with district staff to have a discussion about your water rights. You can come in and, and set up an appointment for your meter to be tested all from the website. You don't even have to give us a call. If you don't want to talk to us, we get it. You can go through the website and do it. Uh, calendar of events. If uh, we have a meeting scheduled, we post it to there immediately and it's live. As soon as we get that event posted, it goes straight to the website uh, as well as any agenda that would be for that, for that meeting. Uh, Water bank. We are in the midst of a five-year review according to statute. Uh, it takes a look at what we're doing as a water bank to make sure that we are complying with all rules and regulations and statutes for Kansas. Uh, it's comprised of several uh, entities, not just water users, but also uh, economists, uh, university representatives, uh, water users outside of the area, water users from within the area to give a very thorough and independent look at what's going on in the water bank. Uh, we are in officially the last week of that review. Uh, we had a meeting today on this uh, and good things are happening. I'm, I'm very encouraged by that review. I, I love those reviews. I think they are very beneficial to making sure that what we're doing as a water bank not only meets the statute, but is in line with what you as producers want to have that water bank do, uh, so long as it doesn't violate statute. Um, yeah, we have one more week. We, water office and this evaluation committee have one more week, technically, to submit a report to, to these folks uh, in Topeka. Uh, okay. What's been going on in the water bank? You'll notice the savings accounts continue to be the predominant use of the water bank. Uh, this year we had only 147. Uh, it's double from last year, give or take. But we don't, we're not matching the numbers that we had before. That's not a, not a surprise. It's still very encouraging to see those high numbers of participants coming in, wanting to act, activate a savings account. Uh, the deadline for doing this, April 1, for making a deposit into the bank. I'm not going into a lot of detail of how the water bank works intentionally for the interest of time. Uh, but if you want to have water deposited into the bank for use somewhere else, that deadline is April 1. If you want to open a new savings account for preserving a portion of unused water into future years, that deadline is December 1. Okay? And I can get into a lot more detail if you don't, if you want, but if you could, let's, let's push that to the side for tonight. So right now we have about 1,500 savings accounts, which is pretty remarkable. The fees, this is a fee-driven animal. Uh, they did not change from last year. Uh, so here they are. They are posted to our website for your perusal at your leisure. Uh, Real-time notification. This is new as of about two weeks ago or so. Uh, if you want to be notified of water becoming available in your sub-basin, this is the only mechanism that you're going to get notified on. It is an opt-in system. Uh, you can opt-in or opt-down at, at your desire. 
It's very user friendly, very easy to get into. There's no special strings attached. You go to the website and just click the sub basins you want to be a, a notified on, and you'll get a notification when there's activity in those sub basins. Why is that important? There's water available today for lease. That's not very many years I get to say that. I, I like doing this. There's 326 acre feet and change available today for lease in the ARC subbasin. It is utilizing a sealed bid system, so we would need to get a bid in for what you want to pay for that water. Uh, minimum bid is $75 per acre foot. That's the reserve. Anything above that, high bid wins. Uh, those bids must be received in our office by the end of business, February 28th. At that point on March 1, I will sit down with staff and we'll open those up. And whoever is the high bid is going to get their priority on getting their water fulfilled. Uh, there is a fee for filing that. We want serious bidders here, so it is $150 to submit a bid. It is done using the application for lease form available on our website. Further details about how this all works can be found on, the, on this website below. Or you can hit up John or, or myself uh, or any of the water bank board for further details on how this sealed bid system works. Uh, but at this point, we do not have any bids. So if you want an option on this, let us know and we'll get going. Again, right now, by the way, there are only four people on the ARC sub-basin notification list. So if you weren't notified, you're not one of those four. Okay? Uh, so if you want to be notified, get on there. And when we notify again coming up uh, this next week, you'll get that notification. We'll see what it looks like. So the end of next week is what I'm trying to get at, is the deadline. Any questions on how this sealed bid system works with the, with the lease program? Um, and with that, I will get out of your hair and, and, and sit down for once. Um, unless there's any questions on anything we do as a water bank or as a big bin. Sweet, you guys are letting me off easy today. This is great. With that, I think it's Barry, right? No. Who is it? Is it John? All right. John Donnelly with uh, Divine Donnelly Murray. <coughs> Yep. Thanks, Warren. I'll be very, very brief, and I'm I actually am really excited to be brief because the last oh, four years we've had the House Water Committee up there. We don't have a House Water Committee anymore this year. They actually disbanded that uh, committee, so there's been a lot fewer water bills. Uh, that was a committee where bills went to die, basically. It, it seemed like there were lots of ideas that floated around and didn't go anywhere. Uh, and we also are kind of, uh, I guess, losing a little bit of our vision, I'll put it that way, uh, which is, is somewhat of a, a, a relief. Uh, we don't, aren't having as many water bills being pushed through from the administration, the new administration. They're still trying to get their feet under themselves. Uh, so really, there's only one water bill that's uh, floating around, and it actually had a hearing today at Senate Bill 182. Uh, it was actually proposed by the Kansas Livestock Association. Uh, just as some background, it was in response to, I'm sure many of you heard about uh, KBI and Attorney General's investigations into some water meters uh, all across uh, mainly the western half of the state. Uh, and anyways, there was a criminal investigation. There, they found nothing was there, so they told DWR that they could. There was the, the only remedy was through the civil action. So there were some civil actions brought against some folks about tampering with meters. Uh, the producers and, and the, the people that were involved in that, uh, some of them didn't think that that was a proper way to handle that and have brought forward a uh, meter tech bill that basically, in, in a very brief summary, uh, would, would create a situation where if you have a water technician come work on your meter, it is sealed, the seal's not broken, uh, you, you, there's no knowingly proof, there's no proof of intent then you would basically have liability protection and they could not bring a fine against you or any uh, or any suspension of your water right. The hearing was held on that today. Uh, there were proponents, neutral testimony, and some opposition from some other GMDs. 
Uh, I think the direction that will be going is there will be a working group over the summer to try to come up with some resolutions uh, to that issue. I, I think a little of that also blends in with some of the increased fines that uh, have been showing up around the countryside for either uh, in, inadequate reporting of water use reports or also some over pumping. Uh, so all of this discussion I'm, I'm guessing is going to be blended together uh, and, and, and both sides will need to kind of talk about their story and, and explain what they want to do. I know from DWR's perspective what we're hearing is, is they want to have enough penalties and the availability to go after someone on the first year if it truly is a bad actor that someone that just made the economic decision I don't have any I don't have any check marks on my file I'm just going to go ahead and pump because I need to right now with the ones that are, that are just mistakes where something just may have over pumped for a little bit or, or whatever. So those discussions are ongoing right now. I don't see anything coming this legislative session, uh, but I do think that that, will, that discussion will continue to heat up through the summer. So pay attention to that. Uh, tell your association that you're involved with, the GMD uh, board, kind of what your thoughts on that if you, you feel uh, that's necessary. So that's, that's the big issue that's happening in the waterfront right now. Uh, as always, the, the water budget uh, on the water, the, the water authority budget uh, and, and whether those monies will go into the Kansas water plan, uh, I think it's still yet to be seen. Uh, the proposal, as I recall from the governor's budget, was to put a similar amount to what they did last year. We'll see what happens as we go through the process. Uh, you know, at the end of the year, right now it's showing that we'll have uh, probably closer to $800 million surplus this year uh, in the state general fund budget. Uh, however, they've got $90 million that the court has ordered that they have to pay for K-12 education and, and other expenses that they're, they're good at spending money. I'm, I'll just put, leave it at that. And I think the ending balances within the next few years will go back in negative. So uh, it's, it's, it's interesting having a Republican con uh, House and Senate with the Democratic governor again. It's been eight years since we've dealt with that dynamic and everyone's trying to figure out how that works again. So uh, I think... The, the politics will be fun to watch from afar. Uh, you can all pity me for being there close to it for the next few weeks because it's, it's going to get ugly here for a while. But uh, anyways, that's kind of the round, the, the general view of things in Topeka. Uh, as, as Orrin had said, we monitor things for the, the GMD board. Uh, we also represent a lot of other interests as well. Um, but we, we try to keep the Orrin and, and the board as up to speed as we can uh, on issues that are affecting us. Luckily on the water side, it's a little bit slower this year. Uh, I think the only other thing that I can think of that's really popped up is a, an open meetings bill that, that actually we didn't engage on, uh, but it was, would have required meetings to be recorded and put online within 24 hours. And, and I think the local townships and fire districts pretty well killed that bill because I don't think many of them even would have online presence. So uh, some, sometimes they're lucky to have minutes. But uh, anyways, with that, I guess I'd stand for any questions that you all might have. I, I'm trying to be as brief as possible. Thank you. Okay. Now, next up, we'll have uh, Jeff Lanterman, the Water Commissioner from Stafford Field Office, and I'll get you a setup, Jeff. Right. Um, most of you guys know me already. I'm the local water commissioner. Um, I administer water rights. I don't make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. Yeah. Um, I only got like three slides here. Um, right now, you know, I know it's a late night, so um, it, I just wanted to talk about the major issues that are going on in my field office and uh, pretty much uh, some of the um, most uh, significant issues in the state right now are in our field office. and. I know you guys realize that. Um, I'm not going to go into anything additional on the Quiberia impairment complaint. Uh, you heard uh, the most significant um, uh, developments happened today, and that's where it all stands. So you've heard all of that. Um, as far as uh, we keep our website up to date, uh, I put the, the website address up there. Uh, we try to keep that up to date with any of our um, uh, latest information 
more positions on that. So uh, keep your eye on that. Um, it's up to date as as things go. I imagine the Lima will be up there um, probably tomorrow. The new Lima. So. Um, as far as the change applications for the city of Hayes, you'll hear David uh, Barfield talk about that. And uh, you've probably heard about it in the news. That is at the top of his list right now. That is pretty much what he is working on right now. Um, our, the uh, public comments were closed last September uh, with regards to the uh, change applications. Um, right now, David is working through uh, the very good comments made and recommendations from the Groundwater Management District, uh, Water Protection Association of Central Kansas, as well as all of the other public comments. Um, hope to have uh, uh, a decision on those change applications uh, very soon. Um, uh, one of the other uh, huge projects that does not affect you guys at all is the uh, Wichita has requested some changes to their um, <coughs> aquifer storage and recovery project in uh, Hardy County. Uh, this is, uh, these are pretty major changes and um, uh, the groundwater management district and uh, local water users have uh, been having a lot of input on that. We have a two day hearing scheduled coming up in uh, uh, late March. And uh, I don't think the two days are gonna are gonna cut it. So uh, chief engineer is the hearing officer on that. So um, one of the other issues that um, I've heard a lot of concern about uh, from probably a lot of you already is um, the, the water use reports. Uh, there is a new fee effective this year um, for paper water use reports. Um, if uh, you file online, that, that fee is waived. So um, right now I've got some statistics. So uh, please just be aware, how, how many of you guys have uh, filed your water use report online already? Uh, lots of hands, that, that's about right. Um, this, is, this is the statistics on our water use reporting system. As of today, we had almost 60% of all water use reports have been filed online. Um, so, um, uh, to that effect, um, how do I get to the video? Uh, to that effect, uh, uh, to help you guys who haven't done it yet, um, we put together a video on uh, water use reporting. And uh, I wanted to play that for you guys because it, it's really easy, uh, it's really nice to do. Uh, we put together a good system. Uh, it's expensive, and that's one of the reasons for the fee on paper water use reports. Um, so it's just a quick video that shows you how to do it. Welcome to the Division of Water Resources tutorial on how to submit your annual irrigation water use report online. In order to report online, you will need the following. An email address and PIN and person ID numbers. Note if you exit the reporting website before submitting the report, your progress will be saved from the last save button clicked. First, you will need to locate your PIN and person ID numbers. These can be found in the bottom left corner of the water use report mailed to you in January. PIN and person ID numbers are unique to you. Now navigate to www.kswateruseReport.org. On the home screen, you will use the PIN and person ID numbers on the mailed card to log in. Below is additional information and instructions, as well as contact information for all DWR offices. Now log in. The next page shows the current name and address we have on file for this person ID number. If a change in water use correspondent is needed, click this link. If a change in ownership is needed, click this link. Now select either address is incorrect or address is correct to move on. After confirming or updating your mailing address, the reporting process begins. This page is a summarization of all file numbers associated with your person ID. If you submitted an annual water use report online in the past, these reports can be accessed here. Clicking on a file number will open a description box that describes the location of the point of diversion. 
To report for a single file number, click the file number and select the Acre Group button. If two or more file numbers irrigate the same place of use, select the Acre Group buttons for all files that irrigate that place of use. After selecting the appropriate Acre Group box or boxes, click Report on Selected. The file number and point of diversion are located in the far left column. Optionally, you can add an alias to this point of diversion to help you identify it quickly in future reports. In the next box, you will indicate if the point of diversion was used in the previous calendar year. If it was not used, you will need to select an option in the pop-up. Here you can indicate reasons for non-use, such as adequate rain, insufficient water, water quality issues, and much more. If the point of diversion was used in the previous calendar year, select Yes. Now you will input the number of acres irrigated, crops grown on those acres and whether or not it was a double crop, the type of energy and system for your point of diversion, the number of end guns, and if you plan to chemigate in the year following this reporting season. Now click the quantity box. A pop-up will open showing you the options for reporting your water use quantities. There are four available options to report your water use. Most commonly, you will report your water use via meter readings. Select the appropriate number of rolling digits on your meter face and the units and the multiplication factor your meter uses. Click Next. Enter your beginning and ending meter readings in the appropriate boxes, making sure to include leading zeros. Do not round and do not include the multiplication factor. Indicate if your meter rolled over more than once during the calendar year. If it rolled over more than once, you will need to estimate your quantity. Clicking Calculate will provide you with the total quantity of water reported, including the multiplication factor. Click Next. Parts 3 and 4 allow you to modify the quantity and add hours and rate pumped. Click Save to finish reporting meter readings. The remaining optional boxes allow you to input well depth data and any additional comments. When finished reporting for this point of diversion, click Next. The reporting process is slightly different for multiple points of diversion that are irrigating the same acres and a battery of wells with two or more meters. If reporting for a battery of wells, you have two options. One, if all wells share a single meter, report only on the geo center. Or two, if there are two or more meters within the battery, report on the individual meters. Reporting on the geo center is the same process as reporting for a single well as shown before. When you click Report on Selected, a pop up will ensure you mean to report on individual meters. You will notice that only one well will be allowed to have the acres and crops reported. The acres entered here will automatically be prorated amongst all points of diversion listed on this page. In the box where you indicate whether the point of diversion was used or not, a third option for combined with another PD is available. This option means that you are reporting use on a point of diversion that irrigates the same acres as the point of diversion selected yes. We suggest you do not change combined with another PD to yes. However, you should select no if the point of diversion wasn't used. The Combined Quantity 2 option allows you to indicate if this point of diversion shares a meter with one or more other points of diversion listed on this page. Clicking it will gray out the quantity box. Report the quantity under the point of diversion it shares a meter with. Use the comment box to indicate which point of diversion it shares a meter with. Report the quantity, type of system, and type of energy, number of end guns, and chemigation status for all points of diversion that are reporting use to finish this page. If your meter broke or you had more than one meter recording water usage, you will need to use option 3 to report. Indicate if you are reporting for a broken meter or routine maintenance, such as calibration. For this example, we will be reporting for a broken meter that was removed with DWR permission. Click Next. On the first set of meter readings, indicate the number of rolling digits, the meter unit, and the multiplication factor shown on your meter face. Enter the beginning and ending meter reading your meter displayed when it broke or was removed. Then indicate if this meter rolled over more than once before it broke. 
Click Calculate and ensure the quantity is accurate. Click Next. If you ran the pump while the meter was removed, enter the hours pumped and the pump rate, then click Calculate and ensure the quantity is accurate. Click Next. If your meter broke and you could not get it replaced before the end of the calendar year, skip step 4 and move to step 5. If you did replace your broken meter or had it repaired and reinstalled, enter the information for the replacement meter in step 4. Click Next. Ensure quantities here are correct and indicate if you are certain your first meter readings are reliable. If the first meter readings are not reliable, then the hours and rate reported should include the use up until the new meter was installed. Click Calculate Total Water Usage, then click Save. When all the files have been reported for, click Finish Irrigation Report. To view a summary of your reported files, click View and Edit. Ensure here all information you will be submitting is accurate. To submit the report, click Sign and Submit. Type in your name and ensure the phone number and email address are accurate. Designate whether you are an owner, agent, or tenant, and write any additional comments. Click the checkbox to indicate you understand that knowingly falsifying this report is a violation of state law. Finally, click Sign and Complete Report. After submitting your water use report, a confirmation email will be sent to you and to the DWR. We advise that you print your reports from the submission confirmation page for your records. For more information or assistance, please contact the Division of Water Resources at 785-564-6638 or email us at kda.wateruse at ks.gov. or come to our office. Um, I know uh, our office and the uh, Groundwater Management District has graciously uh, agreed to assist with water use reporting this year. So. Thank you, Jeff. And I want to reiterate, yes, if you have any issues with Filing your water use report, please get in and see us. Uh, we're, we're trained on how that system works, and we're happy to help you out getting your report filed. I will also say that if you are a participant with a water bank, uh, we need a copy of that water use report submitted to us directly from you. We do not get an automated system report. So if you're a participant, you still have two more weeks to get us a copy of that report and uh, then we'll utilize that for our records. Uh, with that, I will now move on to Barry Bortz with the Regional Advisory Committee. Orrin asked me to visit with you guys for a little bit about uh, what the state's uh, calling their state of the resource document. And John affectionately referred to it as the vision, and this is a byproduct of that vision. Um, and, and let's make this a visit. If you guys have questions, just interrupt, uh, and let's get them taken care of as they come to mind here. The theme that they came up with was the Kansas runs on water. A little history about how it came to be. Um, the process began in, in 2013 um, with the vision process, and there were goal-setting teams for each of 14 regions that were established. Um, and Richard and Fred were part of this process, and, and we had to argue for 14 regions because they initially wanted to group us in with Western Kansas, and we wanted to stand alone on this deal. Uh, almost all of the goals in each of the region have to deal with quality and quantity, um, as you can imagine. Um, 
it was to be a 50-year plan. Um, and in Sam's wisdom, he never set aside any funding and wouldn't campaign for funding for to implement these. And so that's been a major obstacle. Um, this graphic depicts how we use water. Um, the brown is municipal use, and so you can see the majority of the water in the eastern third of the state is municipal use. Um, what's interesting to me is two-thirds of the state gets their water out of the Kansas River Basin and their tributaries. So if you follow the Kansas River from Kansas City back to Lawrence, Topeka, Manhattan, Junction City, um, there's a lot of people get their water there, and thus there's a lot of vote, voting power in that very small quadrant of the state. Um, as you can imagine, most of that's surface water, and that's where our Army Corps dams are that are, have uh, sedimentation problems. And so a lot of those racks in that area will, will talk about how to decrease sedimentation rates. The state has prioritized um, the problems, or, and the purpose is that we would need to ensure sufficient supply of usable water. And then next, they want to educate the public. We have to be able to tell our story uh, in order to have funding opportunities at the legislature. And then we need to decrease the sedimentation rates. This is a map of uh, our region. It's the Great Bend Prairie Region, or Great Bend Prairie Region Advisory Committee is what that's referred to. It's largely the GMD district plus Rush and Ness counties. And so it's kind of a diverse area. We have uh, some of the problems in the eastern part of the district that they have in the eastern part of the state. Um, and then we have some of the problems that they have in the Ovalo out there in Ness County. So uh, we, we take a look at a lot of different things. Um, it's the RAC's responsibility to continue to gather input from the citizens and the stakeholders in the region and communicate these concerns to the Water Authority while monitoring the progress and implementation of the goals. This is the list of our RAC's goals. You've seen these before. Um, they haven't changed. Um, if you want to see the complete list and the action plans, they're on the website at the Kansas Water Authority RAC page. Kansas Water Office. For those of you who don't know, this is Matt Unruh. He kind of handles all the RACs and tells us where we need to be, when we need to be there. So he's a great asset for us on our uh, committees. Um, almost all of the uh, 14 RACs have goals that fit into one of these five categories. Um, eight of the regions have goals dealing with storage issues. Ours just has to happen to be a groundwater storage. You know, do we have enough in storage to fulfill our needs? Uh, a lot of them are surface water, as you can imagine. The conservation part and technology is being dealt with. Uh, demonstration farms and our technology farm, like we have there north of Maxville. Um, the uh, majority of our water comes from the High Plains um, aquifer that is, is unique and different to the uh, Ogallala offer, and that's one of the reasons we wanted our own separate region. Uh, you want to change slides there, I think, one? Um, we do have some alluvial waters, you know, in the Arc River Basin, uh, but the majority of our water comes from the groundwater. Um, something else that you're painfully aware of is we have four wildlife areas. Uh, we have Cheyenne Bottoms, we have Kavira, we have the one in my backyard, Isabel Wetlands, and then we have the Texas uh, Lake Wildlife Area. That's kind of a mini Quivira. I guess it'd be in Barrett's backyard, wouldn't it? Um, we can go to the next one. This is a really busy slide, and it's probably hard for you guys to see. Um, the red depicts the municipal use. Uh, the blue is the uh, blue line is the annual precipitation, and uh, there's no surprise there, and the blue bars are our pumping use. And so there's no surprise when precipitation dips, our pumping goes up. Um, 
And as you notice that, you know, 2010, 11, and 12 were, were, were harsh on everything and everybody. So uh, anyway, the uh, yellow is uh, irrigated acres. That remains relatively constant. And the green line is acre inches applied. That's what that's representing. Um, we looked at several things like this graph. Um, this is a, a 10 year graph of water level changes, uh, accumulation of those blue and red dots that Orrin presented earlier. And uh, again, as water uh, pumping goes up, water tables decline. But when you look at annual data points over a series of years, it's difficult to de uh, determine the trends. And so we've got an engineer on our committee that is just great, Jeff Holstey. He's a great individual, lives out at Jetmore, Kansas. And he took the time to rebuild about 100 hydrographs for us. And then once he had those entered into spreadsheets, we looked at varying time lengths of moving averages. And what we concluded that we about need to go out to a 15 year moving average. And then instead of having these trend lines that go up like this that you can't decipher what's going on, we can straighten those out and it's a lot easier to visualize what's going on over a period of time so that you're not necessarily looking at that drought event and saying, oh my God, you know, we're going to hell in the handbasket kind of event. So anyway, that, that was one of our suggestions that we start going to 15 year uh, moving averages to analyze that stuff. Um, this is a map of, that just is over five years, 2013 to 2017. And for most of the area, we recovered from 2010, 11, and 12. There's a few small spots, uh, the, the darker yellow that showed a decline. But when you're looking at things, always check your units and always check, check your time frame. The next slide will be a, a 20 year one. And so those areas became larger, but we're still dealing in feet. And so that's a relatively comparable map. But then the next slide goes to a 60 year time frame, And all of a sudden the intensity increases when you look at that map. And so when you're telling your stories, make sure you have your units and your timelines straight and what you're trying to tell, okay? This is a, part of the KSU's study that the Water Pack funded. You heard about that earlier. And we don't have to tell you guys this. It, it's not only important, it's vital. We have to have water here to continue to operate. And so that's in part of this presentation, the state of the resource document. And then how do we, how do we solve our problems? And the states came up and suggested these uh, six priority areas. Uh, to focus on and remember there's 13 other chairmen making the same presentation so these aren't specific to our area but it is a state presentation part of that involved the blue ribbon task force which i'm sure most of you have heard about um, and they made a recommendation and their recommendation was set aside a tenth of a cent of sales tax to fund water projects um, that didn't happen but they did call attention that they thought we needed $55 million a year in state funding to, to tax some of these problems. A large part of it would be to remove sediment from reservoirs. Uh, that's a tremendously costly project. They found out in John Redmond, right? Uh, they did a pilot study there. Um, anyway, but knowing that we need $55 million a year you have to be aware that we're not even getting the eight million of general funding to the water office that they, is in state statute now. So we, they did restore, what, a million and a half last year to the budget of general funds? 3.2, and that's the governor's recommendation again this year. And you can help. As it was suggested earlier, we need to get out and tell our story. Uh, any chance you get to talk to a legislature or a community um, group or something, take, your, take an opportunity. If you meet a stranger in an elevator, hey, I'm a farmer. Water's important out here. But that's probably the biggest thing we can do to get funding. 
Remember, this is for our kids and our grandkids. And when I looked at this slide, it reminded me of a little bit of history within our family. And I don't mean to bore you, but largely it takes two generations to affect change. Um, when our great-great-grandfather came over, he spoke German, just German. And his kids started learning English, but it wasn't until the next generation that English was spoken in the house. And then from a personal point, I remember when I was a second, third grader, we got these little newspapers called Weekly Readers. And they suggested that we actually wear seat belts. And so what do we do? We go home, tell mom and dad, and they say, get back up there by the back window and take a nap. Mm -hmm. You know, leave us alone. <laughs> and then we get into driver's ed. And we're supposed to do it again. We got a new family car in 1974. It was a Ford, Ford or a Haven Ford. And we all piled into it and we're all smiles drive around the block and there's this buzzer and the dang thing wouldn't go off. So my dad pulls back into the garage and says something's wrong with his car, there's a buzzer not going off. It was a seatbelt buzzer, so he had him unhook it. We're not gonna wear seatbelts. Okay, then our kids come home from driver's ed and say we need to wear seatbelts. Well, we do for a while, and if we get on a big highway, we do. But now that we got grandkids, everybody wears seatbelts. So again, it takes a couple generations to affect change. So we have to tell our kids why we do the things we do and the mistakes that we make. Because we're not perfect. We've made some mistakes here, guys. Um, have you got questions you want to address? Um, we've got more info available at the Kansas Water Office website. And uh, there's an RSC page there um, if you want to look at stuff. And these guys are a great resource. They, they accumulate all this data. Um, if there's no questions, I'd like to acknowledge some people that worked really hard on your behalf. Um, I don't know how many of you know it, that uh, this group was able to amend a portion of the farm bill for our little area. And that was no small undertaking, um, particularly in this political environment. But Kent Moore and Richard Winstrom, Pat Jansen from Water Pack, Rob Manus and Heidi Mel and Chris Knight from the Agriculture Conservancy, Representative Marshall and Aestis and Senator Moran, Tracy Streeter from the Water Office, Bill Northy, the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, Greg Lewis, and for those of you who don't know it, he needs to be in our prayers and thoughts. His family's struggling right now. Keith Miller from Farm Bureau, and they just did a fabulous job in getting the CREP program modified to allow dry land farming with the hope to meet the GMD's goal to retire some water rights with a voluntary program that if you're faced with making a difficult decision, you could be compensated rather than just having your water right taken. So for those guys, they deserve a round of applause for all their hard work. Thank you. We already have the election results, so I'll turn it over to Tom for the results for GMD. Okay. I think everybody can figure out Holmes Fair and Fred Grender. They're on for the next three years. And then on uh, with Justin Gates and Jeff Price, where we had a tight one. Every vote counts. Uh, Justin won by two votes, uh, 30 to 28. So fill out your ballot <laughs> time. Thanks. Okay, at this time, are there any further questions, comments, or et cetera, et cetera? Like I said earlier, this has been a very trying year for this board, and uh, I think there's light maybe at the end of the tunnel, but I've thought that before, and there wasn't. So, cautiously optimistic. If not, I'd entertain a motion for adjournment. There are a lot of things we have heard, but I, I would encourage uh, the audience to give our GMD board a round of applause for the room. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion. Second from Kevin. All in favor, go home. <laughs>